Now listen. In the country, close by the high road, stood a farmhouse. Perhaps you have passed by and seen it yourself. There was a little flower garden with painted wooden palings in front of it. Close by was a ditch. On its fresh green bank grew a little daisy. The sun shone as warmly and brightly upon it as on the magnificent garden flowers, and therefore it thrived well. One morning it had quite opened, and its little snow-white petals stood around the yellow center, like the rays of the sun. It did not mind that nobody saw it in the grass, and that it was a poor despised flower. On the contrary, it was quite happy, and turned towards the sun, looking upward and listening to the songs of the lark high up in the air. The little daisy was as happy as if the day had been a great holiday, but it was only Monday. All the children were at school, and while they were sitting on the forms and learning their lessons, it sat on its thin green stalk and learnt from the sun and from its surroundings how kind God is, and it rejoiced at the song of the little lark expressed so sweetly and distinctly its own feelings. With a sort of reverence, the daisy looked up to the bird that could fly and sing, but it did not feel envious. I can see and hear, it thought. The sun shines upon me, and the forest kisses me. How rich I am! In the garden close by grew many large and magnificent flowers, and, strange to say, the less fragrance they had, the haughtier and prouder they were. The peonies puffed themselves up in order to be larger than the roses, but size is not everything. The tulips had the finest colors, and they knew it well, too, for they were standing bolt upright like candles, that one might see them the better. In their bright they did not see the little daisy, which looked over to them and thought, how rich and beautiful they are. I am sure the pretty bird will fly down and call upon them. Thank God that I stand so near and can at least see all the splendor. And while the daisy was still thinking, the lark came flying down, crying, Tweet! But not to the peonies and tulips. No, and to the grass, to the poor daisy. Its joy was so great that it did not know what to think. The little bird hopped round it and sang, how beautifully soft the grass is, and what a lovely little flower with its golden heart and silver dress is growing here. The yellow center in the daisy did indeed look like gold, while the petals shone as brightly as silver. How happy the daisy was! No one has the least idea. The bird kissed it with its beak, sang to it, and then rose again up to the blue sky. It was certainly more than a quarter of an hour before the daisy recovered its senses half ashamed, yet glad at heart, it looked over to the other flowers in the garden. Surely they had witnessed its pleasure and the honor that had been done to it. They understood its joy. But the tulips stood more stiffly than ever. Their faces were pointed and red, because they were vexed. The pennies were sulky. It was well that they could not speak, otherwise they would have given the daisy a good lecture. The little flower could very well see that they were ill at ease, and pitied them sincerely. Shortly after this, a girl came into the garden with a large, sharp knife. She went to the tulips and began cutting them off, one after another. Ugh, sighed the daisy. That is terrible. Now they are done for. The girl carried the tulips away. The daisy was glad that it was outside and only a small flower. It felt very grateful. At sunset, it folded its petals and fell asleep, and dreamt all night of the sun and the little bird. On the following morning, when the flower once more stretched forth its tender petals, like little arms, towards the air and light, the daisy recognized the bird's voice, but what it sang sounded so sad. Indeed, the poor bird had good reason to be sad, for it had been caught and put into a cage close by the open window. It sang in the happy days when it could merrily fly about, of fresh green corn in the fields, and of the time when it could soar almost up to the clouds. The poor lark was most unhappy as a prisoner in a cage. The little daisy would have liked so much to help it, but what could be done? Indeed, that was very difficult for such a small flower to find out. It entirely forgot how beautiful everything around it was, how warmly the sun was shining, and how splendidly white its own petals were. It could only think of the poor captive bird, for which it could do nothing. Then two little boys came out of the garden. One of them had a large, sharp knife like that with which the girl had cut the tulips. They came straight towards the little daisy, which could not understand what they wanted. Here is a fine piece of turf for the lark, said one of the boys, and began to cut out a square round the daisy, so that it remained in the center of the grass. Pluck the flower off, 
said the other boy, and the daisy trembled for fear, for to be pulled off meant death to it, and it wished so much to live as it was to go with the square of turf until the poor captive's lark's cage. No, let it stay, said the other boy. It looks so pretty. And so it stayed, and was brought into the lark's cage. The poor bird was lamenting its lost liberty, and beating its wings against the wires, and the little daisy could not speak or utter a consoling word, much as it would have liked to do so. So the forenoon passed. I have no water, said the captive lark. They have all gone out and forgotten to give me anything to drink. My throat is dry and burning. I feel as if I had fire and ice within me, and the air is so oppressive. Alas, I must die and part with the warm sunshine, the fresh green meadows, and all the beauty that God has created. And it thrust its beak into the piece of grass to refresh itself a little. Then it noticed the little daisy and nodded to it, and kissed it with its beak and said, You must also fade in here, poor little flower. You and the piece of grass are all they have given me in exchange for the whole world, which I enjoyed outside. Each little blade of grass shall be a green tree for me, each of your white petals a fragrant flower. Alas, you only remind me of what I have lost. I wish I could console the poor lark, thought the daisy. It could not move one of its leaves, but the fragrance of its delicate petals streamed forth, and was much stronger than such flowers usually have. The bird noticed it, although it was dying with thirst, and its pain tore up the green blades of grass, but did not touch the flower. The evening came, and nobody appeared to bring the poor bird a drop of water. It opened its beautiful wings and fluttered about it in its anguish. A faint and mournful tweet, tweet, was all it could utter. Then it bent its little head towards a flower, and its heart broke for want and longing. The flower could not, as on the previous evening, fold up its petals in sleep. It dropped sorrowfully. The boys only came the next morning. When they saw the dead bird, they began to cry bitterly dug a nice grave for it, and adorned it with flowers. The bird's body was placed in a pretty red box. They wished to bury it with royal honors. While it was alive and sang, they forgot it, and let it suffer want in the cage. Now they cried over it and covered it with flowers. The piece of turf with the little daisy in it was thrown out on the dusty highway. Nobody thought of the flower which had felt so much for the bird and had so greatly desired to comfort it. End of the Daisy Recording by Ginger Kukolo Far away in the land to which the swallows fly when it is winter, dwelt a king who had eleven sons and one daughter named Eliza. The eleven brothers were princes, and each went to school with a star on his breast and a sword by his side. They wrote with diamond pencils on gold slates, and learned the lessons so quickly and read so easily that everyone might know they were princes. Their sister Eliza sat on a little stool of plate glass and had a book full of pictures, which had cost as much as half a kingdom. Oh, these children were indeed happy, but it was not to remain so always. Their father, who was king of the country, married a very wicked queen, who did not love the poor children at all. They knew this from the very first day after the wedding. In the palace there were great festivities, and the children played at receiving company. But instead of having, as usual, all the cakes and apples that were left, she gave them some sand in a teacup, and told them to pretend it was cake. The week after, she sent little Eliza into the country to a peasant and his wife, and then she told the king so many untrue things about the young princes, that he gave himself no more trouble respecting them. Go out into the world and get your own living, said the queen. Fly like great birds who have no voice. But she could not make them as ugly as she wished, for they were turned into eleven beautiful wild swans. Then, with a strange cry, they flew through the windows of the palace, over the park, to the forest beyond. It was early morning when they passed the peasant's cottage, where their sister Eliza lay asleep in her room. They hovered over the roof, twisted their long necks and flapped their wings, but no one heard them or saw them, so they were at last obliged to fly away. High up in the clouds, and over the wide world they flew till they came to a thick, dark wood, which stretched far away to the seashore. Poor little Eliza was alone in her room playing with a green leaf, for she had no other playthings, and she pierced a hole through the leaf, and looked through it at the sun, and it was as if she saw her brother's clear eyes, and when the warm sun shone on her cheeks, she thought of all the kisses they had given her. 
One day passed just like another. Sometimes the winds rustled through the leaves of the rose bush and would whisper to the roses, Who can be more beautiful than you? But the roses would shake their heads and say, Eliza is. And when the old woman sat at the cottage door on Sunday and read her hymn book, the wind would flutter the leaves and say to the book, Who can be more pious than you? And then the hymn book would answer, Eliza. And the roses in the hymn book told the real truth. At fifteen she returned home, but when the queen saw how beautiful she was, she became full of spite and hatred towards her. Willingly would she have turned her into a swan like her brothers, but she did not dare to do so yet, because the king wished to see his daughter. Early one morning the queen went into the bathroom. It was built of marble, and had soft cushions trimmed with the most beautiful tapestry. She took three toads with her, and kissed them, and said to one, When Eliza comes to the bath, seat yourself upon her head, that she may become as stupid as you are. Then she said to another, Place yourself on her forehead, that she may become as ugly as you are, and that her father may not know her. Rest on her heart, she whispered to the third. Then she will have evil inclinations, and suffer in consequence. So she put the toads into the clear water, and they turned green immediately. She next called Eliza, and helped her to undress, and get into the bath. As Eliza dipped her head under the water, one of the toads sat on her hair, a second on her forehead, and a third on her breast. But she did not seem to notice them, and when she rose out of the water, there were three red poppies floating upon it. Had not the creatures been venomous, or been kissed by the witch, they would have been changed into red roses. At all events, they became flowers, because they had rested on Eliza's head, and on her heart. She was too good, and too innocent for witchcraft to have any power over her. When the wicked queen saw this, she rubbed her face with walnut juice, so that she was quite brown, and then she tangled her beautiful hair and smeared it with disgusting ointment till it was quite impossible to recognize the beautiful Eliza. When her father saw her, he was much shocked, and declared she was not his daughter. No one but the watchdog and the swallows knew her, and they were only poor animals, and could say nothing. Then poor Eliza wept, and thought of her eleven brothers, who were all away. Sorrowfully, she stole away from the palace and walked the whole day over fields and moors, till she came to the great forest, she knew not in what direction to go, but she was so unhappy and longed so for her brothers, who had been, like herself, driven out into the world, that she was determined to seek them. She had been but a short time in the wood when night came on, and she quite lost the path. So she laid herself down on the soft moss, offered up her evening prayer, and leaned her head against the stump of a tree. All nature was still, and the soft, mild air fanned her forehead. The light of hundreds of glowworms shone amidst the grass and the moss, like green fire, and she touched a twig with her hand, ever so lightly. The brilliant insects fell down around her like shooting stars. All night long she dreamt of her brothers. She and they were children again, playing together. She saw them riding with their diamond pencils on golden slates, while she looked at the beautiful picture book which had cost half a kingdom. They were not writing lines and letters, as they used to do but descriptions of the noble deeds they had performed, and of all they had discovered and seen. In the picture book, too, everything was living. The birds sang, and the people came out of the book and spoke to Eliza and her brothers, but as the leaves turned over, they darted back again to their places that all might be in order. When she awoke, the sun was high in the heavens, yet she could not see him, for the lofty trees spread their branches thickly over her head, but his beams were glancing through the leaves here and there, like a golden mist. There was a sweet fragrance from the fresh green verdure, and the birds almost perched upon her shoulders. She heard water rippling from a number of springs, all flowing in a lake with golden sands. Bushes grew thickly around the lake, and at one spot an opening had been made by a deer, through which Eliza went down to the water. The lake was so clear that, had not the wind rustled the branches of the trees and the bushes so that they moved, they would have appeared as if painted in the depths of the lake, for every leaf was reflected in the water, whether it stood in the shade or the sunshine. As soon as Eliza saw her own face, she was quite terrified at finding it so brown and ugly, but when she wetted her little hand and rubbed her eyes and forehead, 
the white skin gleamed forth once more, and after she had undressed and dipped herself in the fresh water, a more beautiful king's daughter could not be found in the wide world. As soon as she had dressed herself again and braided her long hair, she went to the bubbling spring and drank some water out of the hollow of her hand. Then she wandered far into the forest, not knowing whither she went. She thought of her brothers and felt sure that God had not forsaken her. It is God who makes the wild apples grow in the wood to satisfy the hungry. And he now led her to one of these trees, which was so loaded with fruit that the boughs bent beneath the weight. Here she held her noonday repast, placed props under the boughs, and then went into the gloomiest depths of the forest. It was so still that she could hear the sound of her own footsteps, as well as the rustling of every withered leaf which she crushed under her feet. Not a bird was to be seen. Not a sunbeam could penetrate through the large dark boughs of the trees. Their lofty trunks stood so close together that, when she looked before her, it seemed as if they were enclosed within trellis work. Such solitude she had never known before. The night was very dark. Not a single glowworm glittered in the moss. Sorrowfully, she laid herself down to sleep, and, after a while, it seemed to her as if the branches of the trees parted over her head, and that the mild eyes of angels looked down upon her from heaven. When she awoke in the morning, she knew not whether she had dreamt this, or if it had really been so. Then she continued her wandering, but she had not gone many steps forward when she met an old woman with berries in her basket, and she gave her a few to eat. Then Eliza asked her if she had not seen eleven princes riding through the forest. No, replied the old woman, but I saw yesterday eleven swans, with gold crowns on their heads, swimming on a river close by. Then she led Eliza a little distance further to a sloping bank, and at the foot of it wound a little river. The trees on its banks stretched their long leafy branches across the water towards each other, and where the growth prevented them from meeting naturally, the roots had torn themselves away from the ground, so that the branches might mingle their foliage as they hung over the water. Eliza bade the old woman farewell, and walked by the flowing river, till she reached the shore of the open sea. And there, before the young maiden's eyes, lay the glorious ocean, but not a sail appeared on its surface, not even a boat could be seen. How was she to go farther? She noticed how the countless pebbles on the seashore had been smoothed and rounded by the action of the water. Glass iron, stones, everything that lay there mingled together, had taken its shape from the same power, and felt as smooth, or even smoother than her own delicate hand. The water rolls on without weariness, she said, till all that is hard becomes smooth. So will I be unwearied in my task. Thanks for your lessons, bright rolling waves. My heart tells me that you will lead me to my dear brothers. On the foam-covered seaweeds lay eleven white swan feathers, which she gathered up and placed together. Drops of water lay upon them, whether they were dew drops or tears, no one could say. Lonely as it was on the seashore, she did not observe it, for the ever-moving sea showed more changes in a few hours than the most varying lake could produce during a whole year. If a black heavy cloud arose, it was as if the sea said, I can look dark and angry too. And then the wind blew, and the waves turned to white foam as they rolled. When the wind slept, and the clouds glowed with the red sunlight, then the sea looked like a rose leaf. But however quietly its white glassy surface rested, there was still a motion on the shore, as its waves rose and fell like the breast of a sleeping child. When the sun was about to set, Eliza saw eleven white swans with golden crowns on their heads, flying towards the land, one behind the other, like a long white ribbon. Then Eliza went down the slope from the shore, and hid herself behind the bushes, the swans alighted quite close to her and flapped their great white wings. As soon as the sun had disappeared under the water, the feathers of the swans fell off, and eleven beautiful princes, Eliza's brothers, stood near her. She uttered a loud cry, for, although they were very much changed, she knew them immediately. She sprang into their arms and called them each by name. Then how happy the princes were at meeting their little sister again, for they recognized her, although she had grown so tall and beautiful. They laughed and they wept, and very soon understood how wickedly their mother had acted to them all. We brothers, said the eldest, fly about as wild swans, so long as the sun is in the sky. But as soon as it sinks behind the hills, we recover our human shape. Therefore, we must always be near a resting place for our feet before sunset. 
for if we should be flying towards the clouds at the time we recovered our natural shape as men, we should sink deep into the sea. We do not dwell here, but in a land just as fair, that lies beyond the ocean, which we have to cross for a long distance. There is no island in our passage upon which we could pass the night, nothing but a little rock rising out of the sea, upon which we can scarcely stand with safety, even closely crowded together. If the sea is rough, the foam dashes over us, yet we thank God even for this rock. We have passed whole nights upon it, or we should never have reached our beloved fatherland, for our flight across the sea occupies two of the longest days in the year. We have permission to visit our home once in every year, and to remain eleven days, during which we fly across the forest to look once more at the palace where our father dwells, and where we were born, and at the church where our mother lies buried. Here it seems as if the very trees and bushes were related to us. The wild horses leap over the plains as we have seen them in our childhood. The charcoal burners sing the old songs to which we have danced as children. This is our fatherland, to which we are drawn by loving ties. And here we have found you, our dear little sister. Two days longer we can remain here, and then we must fly away to a beautiful land which is not our home. And how can we take you with us? We have neither ship nor boat. How can I break this spell? said their sister. And then she talked about it nearly the whole night, only slumbering for a few hours. Eliza was awakened by the rustling of the swan's wings as they soared above. Her brothers were again changed to swans, and they flew in circles wider and wider till they were far away. But one of them, the youngest swan, remained behind, and laid his head in his sister's lap while she stroked his wings, and they remained together the whole day. Towards evening the rest came back, and as the sun went down they resumed their natural forms. Tomorrow, said one, we shall fly away, not to return again until a whole year has passed. But we cannot leave you here. Have you courage to go with us? My arm is strong enough to carry you through the wood, and will not all our wings be strong enough to fly with you over the sea? Yes, take me with you, said Eliza. Then they spent the whole night in weaving a net with the pliant willow and rushes. It was very large and strong. Eliza laid herself down on the net, and when the sun rose, and her brothers again became wild swans, they took up the net with their beaks, and they flew up to the clouds with their dear sister, who still slept. The sunbeams fell on her face, therefore one of the swans soared over her head, so that his broad wings might shade her. They were far from the land when Eliza woke. She thought she must still be dreaming. It seemed so strange to her to feel herself being carried so high in the air over the sea. By her side lay a branch full of beautiful ripe berries, and a bundle of sweet roots. The youngest of her brothers had gathered them for her, and placed them by her side. She smiled her thanks to him. She knew it was the same who had hovered over her to shade her with his wings. They were now so high, that a large ship beneath them looked like a white seagull skimming the waves. A great cloud floating behind them appeared like a vast mountain, and upon it Eliza saw her own shadow and those of the eleven swans, looking gigantic in size. Altogether it formed a more beautiful picture than she had ever seen, but as the sun rose higher and the clouds were left behind, the shadowy picture vanished away. Onward the whole day they flew through the air like a winged arrow, yet more slowly than usual, for they had their sister to carry. The weather seemed inclined to be stormy, and Eliza watched the sinking sun with great anxiety, for the little rock of the ocean was not yet in sight. It appeared to her as if the swans were making great efforts with their wings. Alas, she was the cause of their not advancing more quickly. When the sun set, they would change to men, fall into the sea and be drowned. Then she offered a prayer from her inmost heart, but still no appearance of the rock. Dark clouds came nearer, the gusts of wind told of a coming storm, while from a thick, heavy mass of clouds the lightning burst forth flash after flash. The sun had reached the edge of the sea when the swans darted down so swiftly that Eliza's head trembled. She believed they were falling, but they again soared onward. Presently she caught sight of the rock just below them, and by this time the sun was half hidden by the waves. The rock did not appear larger than a seal's head thrust out of the water. They sunk so rapidly that at the moment their feet touched the rock, it shone only like a star, and at last disappeared like the last spark in a piece of burnt paper. Then she saw her brothers standing closely round her with their arms linked together. There was but just room enough for them, and not the smallest space to spare. The sea dashed against the rock and covered them with spray. 
The heavens were lighted up with continual flashes, and peal after peal of thunder rolled. But the sister and brother sat holding each other's hands, and singing hymns from which they gained hope and courage. In the early dawn the air became calm and still, and at sunrise the swans flew away from the rock with Eliza. The sea was still rough, and from their high position in the air the white foam on the dark green waves looked like millions of swans swimming on the water. As the sun rose higher, Eliza saw before her, floating on the air, a range of mountains with shining masses of ice on their summits. In the center rose a castle apparently a mile long, with rows of columns rising one above another, while around it palm trees waved and flowers bloomed as large as mill wheels. She asked if this was the land to which they were hastening. The swans shook their heads, for what she beheld were the beautiful, ever-changing cloud palaces of the Fata Morgana, into which no mortal can enter. Eliza was still gazing at the scene when mountains, forests, and castles melted away, and twenty stately churches rose in their stead, with high towers and pointed Gothic windows. Eliza even fancied she could hear the tones of the organ, but it was the music of the murmuring sea which she heard. As they drew nearer to the churches, they also changed into a fleet of ships, which seemed to be sailing beneath her. But as she looked again, she found it was only a sea mist gliding over the ocean. So there continued to pass before her eyes a constant change of scene, till at last she saw the real land to which they were bound, with its blue mountains, its cedar forests, and its cities and palaces. Long before the sun went down, she sat on a rock, in front of a large cave, on the floor of which the overgrown yet delicate green creeping plants looked like an embroidered carpet. Now we shall expect to hear what you dream of tonight, said the youngest brother, as he showed his sister her bedroom. Heaven grant that I may dream how to save you, she replied, and this thought took such hold upon her mind that she prayed earnestly to God for help, and even in her sleep she continued to pray. Then it appeared to her as if she were flying high in the air towards the cloudy palace of the Fata Morgana, and a fairy came out to meet her, radiant and beautiful in appearance, and yet very much like the old woman who had given her berries in the wood and who had told her of the swans with the golden crowns on their heads. Your brothers can be released, said she, if you have only courage and perseverance. True, water is softer than your own delicate hands, and yet it polishes stones into shapes. It feels no pain as your fingers would feel. It has no soul, and cannot suffer such agony and torment as you will have to endure. Do you see the stinging nettle which I hold in my hand? Quantities of the same sort grow round the cave in which you sleep, but none will be of any use to you unless they grow upon the graves in a churchyard. These you must gather even while they burn blisters on your hands. Break them to pieces with your hands and feet, and they will become flax, from which you must spin and weave eleven coats with long sleeves. If these are then thrown over the eleven swans, the spell will be broken. But remember that from the moment you commence your task until it is finished, even should it occupy years of your life, you must not speak. The first word you utter will pierce through the hearts of your brothers like a deadly dagger. Their lives hang upon your tongue. Remember all I have told you. And as she finished speaking, she touched her hand lightly with the nettle, and a pain, as of burning fire, awoke Eliza. It was broad daylight, and close by where she had been sleeping lay a nettle like the one she had seen in her dream. She fell on her knees and offered her thanks to God. Then she went forth from the cave to begin her work with her delicate hands. She groped in amongst the ugly nettles, which burnt great blisters on her hands and arms, but she determined to bear it gladly if only she could release her dear brothers. So she bruised the nettles with her bare feet and spun the flax. At sunset her brothers returned, and were very much frightened when they found her dumb. They believed it to be some new sorcery of their wicked stepmother, but when they saw her hands they understood what she was doing on their behalf, and the youngest brother wept, and where his tears fell the pain ceased, and the burning blisters vanished. She kept to her work all night, for she could not rest till she had released her dear brothers. During the whole of the following day, while her brothers were absent, she sat in solitude, but never before had the time flown so quickly. One coat was already finished, and she begun the second, when she heard the huntsman's horn and was struck with fear. 
The sound came nearer and nearer. She heard the dogs barking and fled with terror into the cave. She hastily bound together the nettles she had gathered into a bundle and set upon them. Immediately a great dog came bounding towards her out of the ravine, and then another and another. They barked loudly, ran back, and then came again. In a very few minutes all the huntsmen stood before the cave, and the handsomest of them was the king of the country. He advanced towards her, for he had never seen a more beautiful maiden. "'How did you come here, my sweet child?' he asked. But Eliza shook her head. She dared not speak, at the cost of her brother's lives. And she hid her hands under her apron, so that the king might not see how she must be suffering. "'Come with me,' he said. "'Here you cannot remain. If you are as good as you are beautiful, I will dress you in silk and velvet.' I will place a golden crown upon your head, and you shall dwell and rule and make your home in my richest castle. And then he lifted her on his horse. She wept and wrung her hands, but the king said, I wish only for your happiness. A time will come when you will thank me for this. And then he galloped away over the mountains, holding her before him on his horse, and the hunters followed behind them. As the sun went down, they approached a fair royal city, with churches and cupolas, on arriving at the castle, the king led her into marble halls, where large fountains played, and where the walls and ceilings were covered with rich paintings. But she had no eyes for all these glorious sights. She could only mourn and weep. Patiently she allowed the women to array her in royal robes, to weave pearls in her hair, and to draw soft gloves over her blistered fingers. As she stood before them in all her rich dress, she looked so dazzlingly beautiful that the court bowed low in her presence. Then the king declared his intention of making her his bride, but the archbishop shook his head and whispered that the fair young maiden was only a witch who had blinded the king's eyes and bewitched his heart. But the king would not listen to this. He ordered the music to sound, the daintiest dishes to be served, and the loveliest maidens to dance. Afterwards he led her through fragrant gardens and lofty halls, but not a smile appeared on her lips or sparkled in her eyes. She looked the very picture of grief. Then the king opened the door of a little chamber in which she was to sleep. It was adorned with rich green tapestry and resembled the cave in which he had found her. On the floor lay the bundle of flax which she had spun from the nettles, and under the ceiling hung the coat she had made. These things had been brought away from the cave as curiosities by one of the huntsmen. Here you can dream yourself back again in the old home in the cave, said the king. Here is the work with which you employed yourself. It will amuse you now in the midst of all this splendor to think of that time. When Eliza saw all these things which lay so near her heart, a smile played around her mouth, and the crimson blood rushed to her cheeks. She thought of her brothers, and their release made her so joyful that she kissed the king's hand. Then he pressed her to his heart. Very soon the joyous church bells announced the marriage feast, and that the beautiful dumb girl out of the wood was to be made the queen of the country. Then the archbishop whispered wicked words in the king's ear, but they did not sink into his heart. The marriage was still to take place, and the archbishop himself had to place the crown on the bride's head. In his wicked spite, he pressed the narrow circlet so tightly on her forehead that it caused her pain. But a heavier weight encircled her heart, sorrow for her brothers. She felt not bodily pain. Her mouth was closed. A single word would cost the lives of her brothers. But she loved the kind, handsome king, who did everything to make her happy more and more each day. She loved him with all her heart, and her eyes beamed with the love she dared not speak. Oh, if she had only been able to confide in him and tell him of her grief. But dumb she must remain till her task was finished. Therefore, at night she crept away into her little chamber, which had been decked out to look like the cave, and quickly wove one coat after another. But when she began the seventh, she found she had no more flax. She knew that the nettle she wanted to use grew in the churchyard, and that she must pluck them herself. How should she get out there? Oh, what is the pain in my fingers to the torment which my heart endures, said she. I must venture. I shall not be denied help from heaven. Then, with a trembling heart, as if she were about to perform a wicked deed, she crept into the garden in the broad moonlight, and passed through the narrow walks and the deserted streets, till she reached the churchyard. 
Then she saw on one of the broad tombstones a group of ghouls. These hideous creatures took off their rags as if they intended to bathe, and then clawing open the fresh graves with their long, skinny fingers, pulled out the dead bodies and ate the flesh. Eliza had to pass close by them, and they fixed their wicked glances upon her, but she prayed silently, gathered the burning nettles, and carried them home with her to the castle. One person only had seen her, and that was the archbishop. He was awake while everybody was asleep. Now he thought his opinion was evidently correct. All was not right with the queen. She was a witch, and had bewitched the king and all the people. Secretly he told the king what he had seen and what he feared, and as the hard words came from his tongue, the carved images of the saints shook their heads as if they would say, It is not so. Eliza is innocent. But the archbishop interpreted it in another way. He believed that they witnessed against her, and were shaking their heads at her wickedness. Two large tears rolled down the king's cheeks, and he went home with doubt in his heart, and at night he pretended to sleep. But there came no real sleep to his eyes, for he saw Eliza get up every night and disappear in her own chamber. From day to day his brow became darker, and Eliza saw it and did not understand the reason, but it alarmed her and made her heart tremble for her brothers. Her hot tears glittered like pearls on the regal velvet and diamonds, while all who saw her were wishing they could be queens. In the meantime, she had almost finished her task. Only one coat of mail was wanting, but she had no flax left, and not a single nettle. Once more only, and for the last time, must she venture to the churchyard and pluck a few handfuls. She thought with terror of the solitary walk, and of the horrible ghouls, but her will was firm, as well as her trust in providence. Eliza went, and the king and the archbishop followed her. They saw her vanish through the wicket gate into the churchyard, and when they came nearer they saw the ghouls sitting on the tombstone, as Eliza had seen them, and the king turned away his head, for he thought she was with them, she whose head had rested on his breast that very evening. The people must condemn her, said he, and she was very quickly condemned by everyone to suffer death by fire. Away from the gorgeous regal halls was she led to a dark, dreary cell, where the wind whistled through the iron bars. Instead of the velvet and silk dresses, they gave her the coats of mail which she had woven to cover her, and the bundle of nettles for a pillow. But nothing they could give her would have pleased her more. She continued her task with joy, and prayed for help, while the street boys sang jeering songs about her, and not a soul comforted her with a kind word. Towards evening, she heard at the grating the flutter of a swan's wing. It was her youngest brother. He had found his sister, and she sobbed for joy, although she knew that very likely this would be the last night she would have to live. But still she could hope, for her task was almost finished, and her brothers were come. Then the archbishop arrived, to be with her during her last hours, as he had promised the king. But she shook her head and begged him, by looks and gestures, not to stay. For in this night she knew she must finish her task, otherwise all her pain and tears and sleepless nights would have been suffered in vain. The archbishop withdrew, uttering bitter words against her, but poor Eliza knew that she was innocent, and diligently continued her work. The little mice ran about the floor. They dragged the nettles to her feet, to help as well as they could and the thrush sat outside the grating of the window, and sang to her the whole night long, as sweetly as possible, to keep up her spirits. It was still twilight, and at least an hour before sunrise, when the eleven brothers stood at the castle gate, and demanded to be brought before the king. They were told it could not be. It was yet almost night, and as the king slept they dared not disturb him. They threatened, they entreated, then the guard appeared, and even the king himself, inquiring what all the noise meant. At this moment the sun rose. The eleven brothers were seen no more, but eleven wild swans flew away over the castle. And now all the people came streaming forth from the gates of the city to see the witch burnt. An old horse drew the cart on which she sat. They had dressed her in a garment of coarse sackcloth. Her lovely hair hung loose on her shoulders. Her cheeks were deadly pale. Her lips moved silently, while her fingers still worked at the green flax. Even on the way to death, she would not give up her task. The ten coats of mail lay at her feet. She was working hard at the eleventh, while the mob jeered her and said, See the witch, how she mutters. 
She has no hymn book in her hand. She sits there with her ugly sorcery. Let us tear it in a thousand pieces. And then they pressed towards her and would have destroyed the coats of mail. But at the same moment, eleven wild swans flew over her and lighted on the cart. Then they flapped their large wings and the crowd drew on one side in alarm. It is a sign from heaven that she is innocent, whispered many of them. But they ventured not to say it aloud. As the executioner seized her by the hand to lift her out of the cart, she hastily threw the eleven coats of mail over the swans and they immediately became eleven handsome princes. But the youngest had a swan's wing instead of an arm, for she had not been able to finish the last sleeve of the coat. Now I may speak, she exclaimed. I am innocent. Then the people who saw what happened bowed to her as before a saint. But she sank lifeless in her brother's arms, overcome with suspense, anguish, and pain. Yes, she is innocent, said the eldest brother. And then he related all that had taken place. And while he spoke, there rose in the air a fragrance as from millions of roses. Every piece of faggot in the pile had taken root, and threw out branches, and appeared a thick hedge, large and high, covered with roses, while above all bloomed a white and shining flower that glittered like a star. This flower the king plucked and placed in Eliza's bosom when she awoke from her swoon with peace and happiness in her heart. And all the church bells rang of themselves, and the birds came in great troops, and a marriage procession returned to the castle, such as no king had ever before seen. End of The Wild Swans Recording by Christopher Taylor A soldier came marching along the high road, left, right, left, right. He had his knapsack on his back, and a sword at his side. He had been to the wars, and was now returning home. As he walked on, he met a very frightful-looking old witch in the road. Her underlip hung quite down on her breast, and she stopped and said, Good evening, soldier. You have a very fine sword, and a large knapsack. And you are a real soldier, so you shall have as much money as ever you like. Thank you, old witch, said the soldier. Do you see that large tree, said the witch, pointing to a tree which stood beside them? Well, it is quite hollow inside, and you must climb to the top, when you will see a hole through which you can let yourself down into the tree to a great depth. I will tie a rope round your body so that I can pull you up again when you call out to me. But what am I to do down there in the tree? asked the soldier. Get money, she replied, for you must know that when you reach the ground under the tree, you will find yourself in a large hall, lighted up by three hundred lamps. You will then see three doors, which can be easily opened, for the keys are in all the locks. On entering the first of the chambers, to which these doors lead, you will see a large chest standing in the middle of the floor, and upon it a dog seated, with a pair of eyes as large as teacups. But you need not be at all afraid of him. I will give you my blue checked apron, which you must spread upon the floor, and then boldly seize hold of the dog and place him upon it. You can then open the chest and take from it as many pence as you please. They are only copper pence. But if you would rather have silver money, you must go into the second chamber. Here you will find another dog, with eyes as big as mill wheels. But do not let that trouble you. Place him upon my apron, and then take what money you please. If, however, you like gold best, enter the third chamber, where there is another chest full of it. The dog who sits on this chest is very dreadful. His eyes are as big as a tower but do not mind him. If he also is placed upon my apron, he cannot hurt you, and you may take from the chest what gold you will. This is not a bad story, said the soldier, but what am I to give you, you old witch? For, of course, you do not mean to tell me all this for nothing. No, said the witch, but I do not ask for a single penny. Only promise to bring me an old tinder-box, which my grandmother left behind, the last time she went down there. 
Very well, I promise. Now tie the rope round my body. Here it is, replied the witch, and here is my blue-checked apron. As soon as the rope was tied, the soldier climbed up the tree and let himself down through the hollow to the ground beneath, and here he found, as the witch had told him, a large hall, in which many hundred lamps were all burning. Then he opened the first door. Ah! There sat the dog, with the eyes as large as teacups, staring at him. "'You're a pretty fellow,' said the soldier, seizing him, and placing him on the witch's apron, while he filled his pockets from the chest, with as many pieces as they would hold. Then he closed the lid, seated the dog upon it again, and walked into another chamber. And sure enough, there sat the dog with eyes as big as mill wheels. "'You had better not look at me in that way,' said the soldier. "'You will make your eyes water.' And then he seated him also upon the apron, and opened the chest. But when he saw what a quantity of silver money it contained, he very quickly threw away all the coppers he had taken, and filled his pockets and his knapsack with nothing but silver. Then he went into the third room, and there the dog was really hideous. His eyes were truly as big as towers, and they turned round and round in his head like wheels. "'Good morning,' said the soldier, touching his cap, for he had never seen such a dog in his life. But after looking at him more closely, he thought he had been civil enough, so he placed him on the floor and opened the chest. "'Good gracious, what a quantity of gold there was, enough to buy all the sugar-sticks of the sweet-stuff women, all the tin soldiers, whips, and rocking-horses in the world, or even the whole town itself. There was indeed an immense quantity.' So the soldier now threw away all the silver money he had taken, and filled his pockets and his knapsack with gold instead, and not only his pockets and his knapsack, but even his cap and boots, so that he could scarcely walk. He was really rich now, so he replaced the dog on the chest, closed the door, and called up through the tree, "'Now pull me out, you old witch. Have you got the tinder-box?' asked the witch. "'No, I declare I quite forgot it.' So he went back and fetched the tinder-box, and then the witch drew him up out of the tree, and he stood again in the high road, with his pockets, his knapsack, his cap, and his boots, full of gold. "'What are you going to do with the tinder-box?' asked the soldier. "'That is nothing to you,' replied the witch. "'You have the money. Now give me the tinder-box.' "'I tell you what,' said the soldier. "'If you don't tell me what you are going to do with it, I will draw my sword and cut off your head. No, said the witch. The soldier immediately cut off her head, and there she lay on the ground. Then he tied up all his money in her apron, and slung it on his back like a bundle, put the tinder-box in his pocket, and walked off to the nearest town. It was a very nice town, and he put up at the best inn, and ordered a dinner of all his favourite dishes, for now he was rich and had plenty of money. The servant, who cleaned his boots, thought they certainly were a shabby pair to be worn by such a rich gentleman, for he had not yet bought any new ones. The next day, however, he procured some good clothes and proper boots, so that our soldier soon became known as a fine gentleman, and the people visited him, and told him all the wonders that were to be seen in the town, and of the king's beautiful daughter, the princess. "'Where can I see her?' asked the soldier. "'She is not to be seen at all,' they said. "'She lives in a large copper castle, surrounded by walls and towers. "'No one but the king himself can pass in or out, "'for there has been a prophecy that she will marry a common soldier, "'and the king cannot bear to think of such a marriage.' "'I should like very much to see her,' thought the soldier, "'but he could not obtain permission to do so. "'However, he passed a very pleasant time, went to the theatre, drove in the king's garden, and gave a great deal of money to the poor, which was very good of him. He remembered what it had been in olden times to be without a shilling. Now he was rich, had fine clothes, and many friends, who all declared he was a fine fellow and a real gentleman, and all this gratified him exceedingly. But his money would not last for ever, and as he spent and gave away a great deal daily, 
and received none, he found himself at last with only two shillings left. So he was obliged to leave his elegant rooms, and live in a little garret under the roof, where he had to clean his own boots, and even mend them with a large needle. None of his friends came to see him. There were too many stairs to mount up. One dark evening he had not even a penny to buy a candle. Then, all at once, he remembered that there was a piece of candle stuck in the tinder-box, which he had brought from the old tree, into which the witch had helped him. He found the tinder-box, but no sooner had he struck a few sparks from the flint and steel, than the door flew open, and a dog with eyes as big as teacups, whom he had seen while down in the tree, stood before him, and said, "'What orders, master?' "'Hello,' said the soldier. "'Well, this is a pleasant tinder-box, if it brings me all I wish for.' "'Bring me some money,' said he to the dog. He was gone in a moment, and presently returned, carrying a large bag of coppers in his mouth. The soldier very soon discovered after this the value of the tinder-box. If he struck the flint once, the dog who sat on the chest of copper money made his appearance. If twice, the dog came from the chest of silver, and if three times, the dog with eyes like towers who watched over the gold. The soldier had now plenty of money. He returned to his elegant rooms, and reappeared in his fine clothes, so that his friends knew him again directly, and made as much of him as before. After a while, he began to think it was very strange that no one could get a look at the princess. Everyone says she is very beautiful, thought he to himself. But what is the use of that if she is to be shut up in a copper castle, surrounded by so many towers? Can I by any means get to see her? Stop! Where is my tinder-box? Then he struck a light, and in a moment the dog with eyes as big as teacups stood before him. It is midnight, said the soldier, yet I should very much like to see the princess, if only for a moment. The dog disappeared instantly, and before the soldier could even look round, he returned with the princess. She was lying on the dog's back asleep, and looked so lovely that everyone who saw her would know she was a real princess. The soldier could not help kissing her, true soldier as he was. Then the dog ran back with the princess, but in the morning, while at breakfast with the king and queen, she told them what a singular dream she had had during the night, of a dog and a soldier, that she had ridden on the dog's back and been kissed by the soldier. That is a very pretty story indeed, said the queen. So the next night one of the old ladies of the court was set to watch by the princess's bed, to discover whether it really was a dream, or what else it might be. The soldier longed very much to see the princess once more, so he sent for the dog again in the night to fetch her, and to run with her as fast as ever he could. But the old lady put on water boots, and ran after him as quickly as he did, and found that he carried the princess into a large house. She thought it would help her to remember the place if she made a large cross on the door with a piece of chalk. Then she went home to bed, and the dog presently returned with the princess. But when he saw that a cross had been made on the door of the house, where the soldier lived, he took another piece of chalk, and made crosses on all the doors in the town, so that the lady-in-waiting might not be able to find out the right door. Early the next morning, the king and queen accompanied the lady, and all the officers of the household, to see where the princess had been. "'Here it is,' said the king, when they came to the first door with a cross on it. "'No, my dear husband, it must be that one,' said the queen, pointing to a second door having a cross also. "'And here is one, and there is another,' they all exclaimed, for there were crosses on all the doors in every direction. So they felt it would be useless to search any farther. But the queen was a very clever woman. She could do a great deal more than merely ride in a carriage. She took her large gold scissors, cut a piece of silk into squares, and made a neat little bag. This bag she filled with buckwheat flour and tied it round the princess's neck, and then she cut a small hole in the bag, so that the flour might be scattered on the ground as the princess went along. During the night the dog came again, and carried the princess on his back, and ran with her to the soldier, who loved her very much, and wished that he had been a prince, 
so that he might have her for a wife. The dog did not observe how the flower ran out of the bag all the way from the castle wall to the soldier's house, and even up to the window where he had climbed with the princess. Therefore, in the morning, the king and queen found out where their daughter had been, and the soldier was taken up and put in prison. Oh, how dark and disagreeable it was as he sat there, and the people said to him, Tomorrow you will be hanged. It was not very pleasant news, and besides, he had left the tinderbox at the inn. In the morning, he could see through the iron grating of the little window how the people were hastening out of the town to see him hanged. He heard the drums beating, and saw the soldiers marching. Everyone ran out to look at them, and a shoemaker's boy, with a leather apron and slippers on, galloped by so fast that one of his slippers flew off and struck against the wall where the soldier sat looking through the iron grating. "'Hello, you shoemaker's boy. You need not be in such a hurry,' cried the soldier to him. "'There will be nothing to see till I come. But if you will run to the house where I have been living, and bring me my tinder-box, you shall have four shillings, but you must put your best foot foremost.' The shoemaker's boy liked the idea of getting the four shillings, so he ran very fast and fetched the tinder-box, and gave it to the soldier. And now we shall see what happened. Outside the town a large gibbet had been erected, round which stood the soldiers and several thousands of people. The king and the queen sat on splendid thrones opposite to the judges and the whole council. The soldier already stood on the ladder, but as they were about to place the rope around his neck, he said that an innocent request was often granted to a poor criminal before he suffered death. He wished very much to smoke a pipe, as it would be the last pipe he should ever smoke in the world. The king could not refuse this request, so the soldier took his tinder-box and struck fire once, twice, thrice, and there in a moment stood all the dogs, the one with eyes as big as teacups, the one with eyes as large as mill-wheels, and the third whose eyes were like towers. "'Help me now, that I may not be hanged,' cried the soldier. And the dogs fell upon the judges and all the councillors, seized one by the legs and another by the nose, and tossed them many feet high in the air, so that they fell down and were dashed to pieces. "'I will not be touched,' said the king, but the largest dog seized him, as well as the queen, and threw them after the others. Then the soldiers and all the people were afraid, and cried, "'Good soldier, you shall be our king, and you shall marry the beautiful princess.' So they placed the soldier in the king's carriage, and the three dogs ran on in front, and cried, Hurrah! And the little boys whistled through their fingers, and the soldiers presented arms. The princess came out of the copper castle, and became queen, which was very pleasing to her. The wedding festivities lasted a whole week, and the dogs sat at the table, and stared with all their eyes. End of the Tinderbox Recording by Daniel Fraser